My name is Louise Connolly. I'm the head of the Educational Consultants Department and Teacher Training and um, Events Manager at Macmillan in Spain. And I would like to welcome you all to the very first edition of our online webinar for the International Curriculum, which is aimed at schools and teachers teaching international curriculum um, in schools all around Western Europe. We are delighted that you could join us this evening. With these online events, we hope to offer you interactive, practical, inspiring and relevant talks with ideas and activities that you can apply to your own classroom and school setting. As you all know, today we have two talks. The first one will be given by Bob Kibble and the second by Andrew Jeffrey. During the talks, you will have the opportunity to interact with the speakers. We will launch what we call Have Your Says, which will be a question, and we will give you, say, 20 seconds, 30 seconds to reply. It will appear on your window as a little window or screen, and all you have to do is write a short answer or keywords. We will also launch what we call polls, which is a question with a multiple choice answer, A, B, C or D. And all you have to do is uh, elect or select the correct answer, A, B, C or D. We would also like to hear from you on your experience of these events. This is the first webinar that we're organizing for Western Europe on the international curriculum and we would really appreciate any comments that you would like to post on our Twitter account or Facebook. Our Twitter account is at Macmillan with capital M E D underscore I C capitals. Also, we will launch at the end of today's event uh, a short survey, a questionnaire because we really value your opinion. And as this is the first event for schools in Western Europe, we would like to hear about your experience of the event, the day, the time, the rele relevance of the talks, and also suggestions for future editions. At the end of each talk, we will also reserve five minutes so that you can send in your questions or comments about the, the content of the talks. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Bob Kibble. Bob has taught English in London. He taught English in London science. for 20... Sorry, not English. Uh, science in London for 22 years. And he was also a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. Bob uh, led the author team on Max Science. He is also the recipient of a very prestigious award, yes, the Bragg Medal, uh, for his um, contribution and a lifetime of service to physics education. So Bob is here this evening to talk to us about the importance of making learning active, um, promoting um, inquiry and discovery through inquiry so that pupils have a deeper understanding of the science concepts. So, welcome Bob. Hi Louise, thank you very much and hello everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. I'm in Barcelona speaking to you, although I live in Scotland. And um, you of course have had a hard day's work, no doubt. And uh, I hope that I can make this next hour relevant uh, to your teaching. Firstly, um, who am I? Well, this is me. This is me uh, some uh, 60 years ago. I was born in London and educated in London. And uh, I've been all my life a teacher, a science teacher. And I've been very proud to be a science teacher all that time. Um, I moved to Scotland to do a job as an educator uh, in the University of Edinburgh. And that's where my last 15 years of work were spent. Um, I now still live in Scotland and uh, it, it's my home. Now. Scotland and Edinburgh is where I start this presentation for you. 
here's that wonderful city. In the city, in the corner, there's a, a place called the Art Centre Cafe, and I had a meeting there in 2016. And the meeting invited me to take on a new project, and Louise has mentioned this. It was chief editor for Max Science. And uh, I've been invited back to, uh, to talk to you in Barcelona three years, uh, three years later now. That um, I want to talk to you really about the journey I've had in those intervening three years, because that journey has forced me to think long and hard about best practice in science education and how I could embed it in a new set of books for teachers and students. These are the questions that were challenging me. I had to really think hard about what do I really know about science teaching and learning? After 40 years, I ought to know something. Science education is a big area. It's always constantly changing. How can we respond to those challenges? So that was my challenge when I led Max Science. And I'm pleased to say that as a result of uh, that work, the team and I have produced a very, uh, a full suite of books to cover the international curriculum based on Cambridge International Syllabus. But less about the Max Science, it's more about science teaching and learning for today's agenda. Here are two questions I'll build this presentation around. And they're questions that you need to think about. The first part of this presentation is based on this question. Have you ever asked yourself, I know you're a science teacher, but why should you be a science teacher? Why should children have to learn science? And the second question, okay, what do we know about learning? How should we teach science? How should children learn science? So there are the two halves of this presentation. So let's look at that first question. Do you have an answer? If you're a science educator, you really ought to be expected to have an answer. Why should all children learn science when maybe only a small fraction will ever become scientists? This is an opportunity for you to engage in our first feedback opinion poll. There's the question, Louise. Yes, so I'm going to activate the poll now. It will appear on your screen and you've got this question to answer what is the most important reason why all children should learn some science and you've got four options a five. b oh, sorry five a b c d or e okay so we'll give you about 20 seconds to do that can i add that uh, perhaps um, you may have your other reasons but these are the five that i've offered you it's a very pertinent question isn't it it's a question that not everyone Everybody bothers to, to, yeah. to ask because mm -hmm. you've just become a science teacher. Exactly. But you may find yourself being asked that question by a teacher of another subject who is desperate for their subject to find a place in the curriculum. And then you're forced to justify yes. why you need to teach science to all children. And I'm also just thinking um, from the point of view of the children themselves, I look back at my own education and I... I studied biology and mm. chemistry mm. in secondary school. Nobody mm. ever raised that question. No. We just went through it. But the, I think the question was there in the subconscious. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're getting um, some answers. Oh, okay. At the moment we're at 50% are saying science skills are life skills. And well, it's going up a little bit, 55%. And 36% are saying we live in fast-moving scientific world. We need to know how things work. 9% are saying the planet needs responsible citizens. So it seems the top score is going for science skills are life skills. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. And thank you for taking part. Um, I, I will have to tell you that in this presentation, you'll find that my heart and my head lies somewhere else. And um, I'm going to tell you about my, um, my mother-in-law who lives in this scientific world, this fast-moving world. She has a television, she has a mobile phone, she has a, she has a washing machine which uses uh, ICT electronic chips inside. She uses them all perfectly and doesn't know how any of them work. And she doesn't need to. And I don't need to. I have a mobile phone, I don't need to know how that works. I just need to read the instructions. 
my car is a high-tech car. I don't need to know how it works. I need to know how to switch it on. So I think there's a fallacy in thinking that just because the world is high-tech, that we actually need to know how high-tech mm. to engage with it. So I think I would question that. Uh, science skills being life skills, some of them may well be, I think. Uh, but you probably will find these same life skills taught in history lessons, in technology lessons, in mathematics lessons, the skills of analysis, the skills of thinking about modelling. They appear in geography as well. So uh, it's not just the domain of science. Mm. But um, let's move on. I'll give you my three top reasons why we should teach science to all children. Here they are. Well, that was one of the choices not many of you uh, opted for, but I think it's a powerful and important choice. Our future, your children's future, depends on it. There's something about science stories that are incredibly rich and almost the greatest legacy that humankind has produced. The histories of, histories of science, those great scientists of the past, have given us a science to share. Let's share that. And finally, there is something about the joy and wonder of discovering something for yourself. So these are my three top reasons for, for learning science, for everyone to learn science. Let's take them one at a time. I think this slide needs very little introduction. Um, we are faced with concepts of recycling, energy management, pollution in the environment. The solution to these problems lies in a, an understanding of science, science of materials, science of energy, science of waste. Uh, it's a sort of science that appears in every citizen's life. We need to, to show that we're responsible enough to take care of animals, to take care of each other, to take care of the environment. That's a powerful reason for learning science. You may find that uh, you find headlines like this uh, in the newspaper. You may see uh, on the TV news people marching um, uh, for, for climate change, for example. You may even see significant figures uh, in the media making comments or making no comments uh, about uh, the future of the world, the future of the planet um, and issues like conservation and issues like global warming and energy change. Uh, you cannot avoid them as a citizen. Therefore, let's teach children to understand what these arguments are about so they can play a part. You can't avoid science also in the media it appears even in cartoons. So science is there, whether you like it or not, in every children's life. How do we introduce a sense of values and responsibility about citizenship for very young children? Here's an idea I've had and I've used with children. These characters come from a well-known Swedish um, furniture shop and uh, some Lego characters from my grandchildren. And taking a photograph of them gives a scene that children can engage with. What do you think now? What's the sheep thinking? Hmm. I might ask children to talk amongst themselves. Well, maybe, maybe it's thinking, what a great opportunity to go on holiday. What's the farmer thinking? I'm hurry tonight. <laughs> There's a tension. And what about mother sheep? Well, what would you be thinking? What about this poor calf who's watching the scene? What's he thinking? <laughs> Could be. Now this is a very simple photograph, but the messages behind the photograph are messages that young children can understand. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to make everyone a vegetarian. I'm trying to show that being responsible as a citizen means you've got to think twice about where your food comes from. You've got to think about the consequences of how we deal with living things on the planet. It's your job to, to tackle these issues with children. This is one way forward. In Max Science, we've tackled the, these issues um, in a number of ways, right the way through the series. Here's an example from one of our books, a uh, page where we're dealing with human differences and similarities. And of course, this is uh, the essence of dealing with uh, tolerance about cultures, about people who look different to us, about people who believe different things to us, about fighting racism and bigotry. It's about living in a better planet. That's part of our responsibility to deal with children as humans. What about the landscape, land use, the balance of ecosystems, 
that's also part of our responsibility as adults in a citizenship. We need to make uh, responsible decisions about how we deal with habitats and how we deal with expansion of urban life. That's your job to bring into the curriculum and we've done that for you here. Let's talk about storytelling. Here's a challenge for you. Can you name any of these scientists? I'll give you a clue. These are their names. Can you match a name to a picture? This is not a formal question. It's just something for you to think about. Well, I'm sure you'll probably recognize Einstein. Marie Curie is on the top row. Between the two of them is, uh, is Robert Hooke, invented the microscope. The second row, we have um, Caroline Herschel, the first woman to discover a comet. And next to her, Ibn al-Haytham, the chap who decided, do you know what, this is how we see things. We see things because light goes into our eyes. Mm. Prior, to, prior to his thought, people thought we saw things because vision emerged from our eyes, rather like Superman. X-ray vision, of course, that's nonsense. We see things because light goes into our eyes. And we have uh, the Islamic uh, scientist Ibn al-Hatham to thank for that. On the page there is um, Democritus, who had the first idea of particles, and Archimedes, and others. The reason why I've shown you this slide is because these people and others offer us what I call the histories of science. The great histories of science. This is the legacy that science has given the world. The great stories to be told, and the stories are there in this slide, there they are. They're part of the histories. And if these scientists could talk today, and some of them are still alive, this is what they say. Hey, science teachers, help children to tell our stories, the stories we've struggled with, we've shared. They're great stories to tell. Yeah, I think that's your job, and that's one of the great reasons why we should teach all children some science. Now, Here's a, a metaphor for us. The great ideas of science could be thought of as a garden of trees. There are only ten trees, you know, in the great ideas of science garden. The, call them the big ideas, the big stories, and I've got a few of them here. This is one of the great ideas. I will run through some of them now. They're ones that you'll recognise, of course. There are only nine there. There's probably a, a tenth one to be thought about. I'll leave you to think about that in your own time. But the point I'm making here is that there are not many big stories to tell. But there are stories there. And uh, the tree of knowledge idea came to my mind when I thought about this. But also, I'm going to extend this metaphor to your classrooms. This is your classroom. And this is your job. The seeds of those ideas need to be sown. They need to be nurtured, watered, cared for. That's the job of a primary school teacher. Don't worry about them growing into huge trees. Someone else will take care of that. But it will never happen unless you sow the seeds. So start telling those stories. Sow those seeds. They're very simple. The textbooks will help you. You know most of them. Here's one of the great storybooks of science, the particle storybook. And I quite like this analogy. I've moved to a different metaphor here. But of course, books made of paper come from trees. The particle storybook is one that uh, we find in years one, years two, years three. It appears many, many times through primary science education. And we start telling these particle stories through things like understanding about materials and feeling materials and oh, materials are very different things and it's interesting how some paper is not the same as other paper. I wonder why that is. And then we think about well, states of matter, solids, liquids and gases and it isn't interesting how water can freeze and there's different states of matter. And actually the particles are all the same there but, uh, but they're in different states. And there are actually particles too small to see. Nobody's ever seen them. We've made it up. It's imagination. But all things are made of particles, you and me and the book, yes, and the trees. We could even draw particle diagrams. We'd explain dissolving using the story of particles. 
or the water cycle, evaporation, and part of the same particles existing in rain and falling down through the sky, and the, they're the same particles of water in the river. That's the particle story. That's what I mean by storytelling. And when we get children to explain things like the water cycle, what we're asking them to do is to tell one of the great stories from science. Finally, the joy of finding out. Hey, you wouldn't be uh, a science teacher if you didn't engage with children in an experimental, practical way. That really is part of our defining feature. What sort of things do we find out about? Well, we find out by looking at those science skills that you mentioned earlier and we all talked about. Here are some of them. One of the, one of the ones that we don't talk about so much is the sort of uncertainty of science discoveries. You know, when children in one table discover something and the children in another table, well, they actually think something else. And, and you as a teacher thinking, oh, I wish they'd all discover the same thing. No, 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 no. Science is messy. Let them discover that actually you can't actually pin down results as well as you might want to. Yeah, it's a messy business. There's uncertainty in science. Go to the doctor. He can't quite diagnose whether you're going to die in a week or two weeks or 10 years. Hmm or whatever, or whether this is the right tablet, we don't know, we'll try it out. Science is an uncertain thing. And that's quite a powerful measurement, a powerful attitude to have. And the others I think you'll probably understand, variables, observing graphs, measuring. Yes, having tried to see what it's like to discover some science for yourself, to be a scientist for the day, that's a powerful thing to share with children. That's how science works. Miss, so that's how science works. And when you find yourself reading a science item in a newspaper just like this, you'll be able to say, I wonder what their sample size was. I wonder if other scientists agree with this result. How many times did they test it? Was there a control used? So science in newspapers, science in your life, science in your children's life. To be able to engage is to be able to have done some science of yourself. So there you are, my three good reasons for including science in the curriculum for all children. We're going to move on to that second great question. And here it is. This is me in this picture with uh, children in uh, China. And I've learned a lot about teaching and learning by, by being with children, teaching them in China. And um, we'll come back to the fact that this is in gr a group picture with me involved uh, listening uh, later on because it's a, that's a powerful image for me. What do we know about learning? Well, how did it used to be for you as a school uh, pupil? I know that 50 years ago for me, my school classroom looked a bit like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, we sat in rows and the teacher would say something like this and maybe... John would give the right answer. And what does that tell the teacher? Nothing at all, really. Just John knows the answer. He hasn't learned anything new. He already knew the answer. But to the teacher feels good because he's given the right answer. The problem is that um, nobody else is engaged at all. This girl can't even see. Um, the way it used to be in black and white. I hope it's not like this in your school still. This sort of education was based on a principle. There was a philosophy underpinning this. And it's known as the transmission model. And it really says, look, I'm the teacher. I have the knowledge. You're the pupils. You're subservient. And the process is my knowledge becoming your knowledge. I fill you up with my knowledge. OK, so that's how it used to be. How has it changed? What do we know now? Well, we have research to thank for a lot of our new approaches to science education. Here's an image from research. Oh, let's first of all go to a, a question for you. Okay, so we have a have your say, and it is, in what ways has teaching changed since these early days? So again, you'll have about 20 or 30 seconds to answer that, just send in short answers or keywords, and they'll come through in a minute. I think it's changed tremendously. Well, it has a lot, and uh, but in fact, in some schools, mm. some schools I visit even now, mm. okay, the wooden desks may not be there, but in fact, they've been placed, replaced by plastic desks. Um, but sadly, there's an awful lot of teaching very similar to this uh, I've seen. 
And uh, I know teachers would like to move forward. Yes. Some, some schools, are some, they have a philosophy where they do think about um, teaching and learning changing yes. and different ways of organising teaching and learning. Um, many schools, in fact, but uh, it's not unknown of no. to see schools still like this. No, I'm just thinking. I'm, uh, when I'm thinking of Dickens and the the the, the novel, um, um, what's it called? Hard Times, mm, mm. the grad grind method yes, right. of education, yeah, yeah. which yeah. was sort of like that, drum it into drum them. it in. I learnt yeah. it like that. I learnt. Yeah. I learnt. And the problem with learning like this is that you don't understand anything. Yes, you just remember a few facts but you understand nothing. Exactly. Well, we're, we've got some answers here. Thank you very much. Um, some people are saying um, there's more te technology. True. Um, now it's more ex experiential. So what you were mentioning about yes, um, yeah. making it hands on. Yes. hands on. And somebody else is saying learning, that there's more learning through doing, which is the same yeah, idea. Yes, yes. I okay, call that so hands on, brains on. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Totally connected, yes. Okay, good, okay. thank you. Thank you for thank that. Thank you. Thank you. And I knew that you would see that how far we've moved. Um, for me, um, I, I like to look at the research, and I, because when I worked at the University of Edinburgh, it was part of my job to, to become more familiar with science education research. And there are some messages from research, I think, that, um, that have helped us a lot. And here's a, here's a typical uh, message from research that, um, that I came across about conceptual development. In this case, it's about gravity. Um, this is a typical drawing that researchers found children uh, drawing when, ex when asked to show how rain falls on the planet. And um, you can see the clouds and the rain and, and, and the cloud at the bottom, of course. Um, if you challenge children about this uh, rain falling and ask them, where's this rain falling at the bottom? They'll tell you uh, 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 with great confidence. They'll say, well, it's, uh, it's, it's falling on the floor. Is there a puddle? Well, there's a puddle on the floor. Because these children are showing evidence that they haven't yet built the concept of gravity as a force pulling into the centre of the Earth. Therefore, these children, there is an absolute down. And it's only by asking children to draw pictures like this that you will see these misconceptions, preconceived ideas in your classroom. Here's another question you may give to children. Mandy throws a ball up in the air and it, it comes straight down. Can you see What's going to happen to the ball when Mandy goes on holiday to Australia? Just ask your children. <laughs> children in the first, second, third year, ask them. It's a very simple question. See what they show and see how they explain this. Is the idea of absolute down still there? This is my favourite of the same sort of question. Here we have two bottles of liquid uh, on the uh, North Pole, let's say. And one bottle is open and the other bottle has a stopper. Let's suppose we move those two bottles to the South Pole. Children, can you draw the liquid? Well, teachers, give them this question and look at their drawings and listen to their answers. And you can probably guess what some of these children will draw. Because <laughs> one of those bottles is going to be empty. And when you ask where the liquid is, well, you know the answer. It's going to be on the floor. So here's an example of science education research which has taught us a lot about children's preconceived ideas and how they already have answers to questions. They just, many of them have the wrong answers. This has led to what's known as a constructivist view of learning, where children construct their own ideas even before they reach your lessons. Here's the typical constructivist uh, set of ideas. You will have heard of this one. Of course, heavy things float, uh, heavy things uh, float and light things sink. That's rubbish, of course. That should be heavy things sink and light things flow, of course. <laughs> That's back to front. Okay. Our bodies. Yeah, of course, when we cut our finger, the blood rushes out. And of course, um, that's because we're full of blood. Of course, I've seen the sun rise and the sun set. And the following day, it rises and it sets. And, and the next day, of course, I know what happens. The sun goes round the earth. Oh, yeah, heavy things. Of course, they fall faster than lighter things. It's obvious. Is it? Well, for many children it is, until you try it out. Clouds, what are they made of? Well, you can just ask a number of children. They'll come up with all sorts of ideas. So the point I'm making here is that children construct their own science. Common sense science, but it may not be correct science. But they'll come to your lessons not empty of ideas, but full of ideas. And our job, therefore, is to try and tackle some of these popular misconceptions. 
value these pre-constructed ideas. Be prepared for their arrival. Listen to children as they explain their ideas. And then build ideas, stronger ideas, correct ideas around them. So you end up with a situation where children can let go of their preconceived ideas and take on a new idea. Here are children working um, as a team of scientists. Mm. Now, there's a message here for you, and it's a message about the way scientists work. They work in groups. Science is a social experience. It's not something you do on your own. The scientists on the top, I think these are bridge building scientists and engineers and the ones down below are um, uh, they're biochemists and of course we've got two other groups of scientists in Chinese primary schools that I visited. They're all working collaboratively, they're talking, they're sharing, they're listening. Good modern science education allows this to happen. It realises that we are part of a social engagement in science. The stories we want these children to tell are stories they share. So, we've moved a long way from the static, this is your place in the classroom position, uh, model of the classroom. The teacher, of course the teacher, is behind the teacher's desk. This is my place, that is your place, it's a power position. Learning, well, I know my place, the teacher talks and I learn, that's learning. I just listen by, by listening to the teacher, that's how I learn. It doesn't take much to move your classroom tables into a new position. Move those tables, sit children in groups, and you have a completely different dynamic in your classroom. The teacher doesn't have a table anymore necessarily. The teacher could be anywhere. They could be working with one group or another group. The teacher will be listening, listening for children's ideas. We talk, the teacher listens. That's learning. That's a huge change from how things used to be. And the storytelling I told you about in terms of the histories of science and the great stories of science, the conceptual development of ideas, language provides the key to unlocking storytelling. So listening to children talk and encouraging them to talk is critical. These scientists that we saw earlier, of course they existed in science communities. They shared their stories together so that they all knew what was happening in particular areas of science. Their understanding was socially constructed amongst scientists, amongst them when they read their, their papers, when they go to conferences, when they work in groups. Here's an example of a socially constructed idea that they all share, not necessarily these scientists in the picture because they didn't live at the same time, but it's an illustration of how we as trained scientists and adults we share a constructed view. The problem is our children may have an alternative view. And the storytelling metaphor for us is how to get our children from one constructive view, view to a shared science view. So they can become a member of our community of storytellers, tells the same story as us. One way to do this is through something called metacognition. It's where we look at ourselves as learners. Children think about themselves as learners. They reflect on themselves as learners. And they reflect on how they change. Do you know what, sir? When I came into this lesson, I used to think this. But after talking and listening and doing experiments, I now realize I was wrong. Now I think this. I've changed my mind. It's cool to change your mind. For me, that's a really powerful statement. We should allow children to feel free to change their mind and to tell you they've changed their mind. And that is reflection on your learning journey. That's called metacognition and that's powerful. If you can find metacognitive situations in your classroom where children can think, hey, do you know what, miss? I, I was someone who said it was like this, but now I understand it's, it's like that. It's okay to change your mind. Powerful things. I'm going to close now with some statements about teaching and learning, about your job. Um, and I'll illustrate them uh, in, in a way that um, hopefully is not too uh, patronising. 
here are you uh, with, with your children. It's just, you can't, it's a simple cartoon of children uh, with a teacher. And these things are on your mind. I bet these things are on your mind when you're teaching science. They were on my mind, my students' minds. Yes, we, everyone's got to think about these things. Have we got enough rulers? Mm-hmm. Is, it, I mean, is everyone busy? Is everyone uh, who's is everyone, no one's missing? Has someone gone, come back from the toilet? How much time have we got left? Can we pack away in time? What about the number of scissors? Is this safe enough? I don't know. Come on, let's. Is it oh, the room tidy? They, hey, the buzzer has got to go for lunch any minute. Bup, 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 <laughs> we're packed away. Let's see who's neatly sitting right. Yes, off we go to lunch. Those sorts of things you think about. They're the mechanical things of managing your lesson. When you do this, I think of it as being your mind in the doing space. The teacher thinking about the doing space. What's happening? What's happening here? What are we doing? And your mind has to be in the doing space. But that's not the only place it needs to be. Your mind needs to be thinking about these things. Your mind needs to be thinking about learning. You've got to find time to put that mind of yours into the learning space. So more than just, let's work out if we've got enough scissors and let's keep an eye on the time. Of course we have to do that. Your job is to think about learning. What are we aiming for here? What do we start with? What are the learning objectives? How do I know we've understood things? What questions? Can I listen to this group? Can I listen to that group? Can I share? Let's interrogate this, intervene here. Learning is on your mind. I want you to move from focusing on what is happening to why is it happening? And so what? So what are we so what's the purpose of it? So why have we done this today, Miss? So why was it important? And getting people to understand that we used to think this and we've moved and we've learnt and we've, we can now tell this story. We now understand better how this works. We've actually learnt something today. We've not only done something, we've done something with a purpose. Moving from the what to the why. And I call this process accommodation and it's a key feature of uh, Max Science uh, Teacher's Guides and, uh, and it should be a key feature of your science teaching as well. Here's an example of uh, what might happen if you ignore accommodation and your head is only on, hands on, brains on, doing things. This is a parent at home talking to their children. Here's a girl who's been to school and her mum says, yes, yeah, so, so, so what did you do at school today? Oh, well, we mixed uh, sugar with water, <laughs> which is one of the things you might do at school. Yeah, yeah, but, um, huh, but what did you learn? Well, we... Uh, we learn we, we could mix sugar with water. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but well, why did you why did you do this? <laughs> of course, because that's what we were told to do, and then it was fun, uh, and then we tidied everything away, and we sat nicely like this, and teacher collected the rulers or whatever. Okay, there's a great danger in many teachers and many schools that this is what happens at the end of lessons. This is what used to happen. We do things because we were told to do them. We did them. The doing was important. We tied it away. We had fun. I don't think it's enough just to have fun. It's not enough just to do some stuff, pack away tight, tidily, and say we've had some fun today. This is what I hope for the world in future teaching. This is what I hope for your teaching. Mother asked the question. We mix sugar with water. Yeah, but, but what did you learn? That's storytelling. That's what I mean by having children, being able to tell the stories of science. And these science, this story is a particle story, of course. That's the goal to be aimed for, and that will only happen through accommodation, through teachers who revisit learning with children and listen to them and invite them to explain the new science ideas. I dream that this is what's going to happen in a brave new world in the future. This is my hope for your science teaching, and this was my hope when I led the team for Max Science. I'm going to finish off with a little word or two about modelling. This is a page from Max Science, and this would no doubt resonate with many science teachers. Uh, Shadows are a fabulous thing to study, and we study them regularly throughout primary school. And here's someone considering her shadow, 
and this was one of the pages in Max Science. And um, one of the things that we do is to um, is to encourage children to make their own sundial, which is a shadow clock, of course. And uh, here's an image which I use. This is one I made earlier. Here's another one I have here. It's a simple thing. It's just made from a piece of card and uh, and um, what would you call it? These are toothpick sort of thing. Toothpick, yeah. Toothpick, and it just sits quietly there. And uh, if you place this um, at an angle and you and you point the stick towards north, you'll find that the shadow will go to a number, and it's roughly the time of day. It will never be accurate. You won't be able to catch a bus <laughs> or a train based on your sundial, but it gives you the principle of times. Of course, if you wait, the shadow will change. And 10 o'clock will become 11 o'clock and you go out again if you marked where you're lining your sundial up and place it in the same place you'll find it's gone to 12 o'clock and so on and so you have a shadow clock of course if you don't uh, have a sunny day you may be tempted to take a torch and and you could model the sun and you can show in real time the shadows moving and whenever I do this children are amazed to see the shadow moving but there is a problem so when you move the sun to show the shadow moving, you're reinforcing a misconception that the sun moves. And that challenged me for many, many years as a teacher. And the solution I came up with uh, was, um, was to have a, have a model. And I'm going to show you a video of a model. And um, we'll see if we can get the video moving. And I think you should see on your screens a video First of all, you'll see the shadow moving because someone holding the torch is moving the torch. But we can have the shadow moving if the torch stays still, the sun stays still, and the earth is moving. And that offers you a second, and children, a second way of thinking about why it is that the sundial shadow moves. And we can't prove that the earth is turning, not easily. But we can actually challenge thinking. And remember what I said about sowing the seeds. You can sow the seeds and allow someone else to water that plant later. But your job is to sow those seeds. I've got just one more thing to show you today before I finish. And Louise has this yes. model. I've got a model I made earlier, which you won't be able to see uh, so well. But, it, um, but it's a yes. globe here. And I don't know whether you, whether you can see this, but I've made... Too many sundials. <laughs> They're just too many sundials. And this it's is the so sort of... creative. Well, it's the sort of globe... Well, I know you'll be creative too, but um, it's what teachers do. Mm. But um, they're the sort of sundials I had on, on the video. And uh, if we had a, a single light here, we've got studio lights, so they don't work. But if we had a single light, you'd see the shadow, and you'd be able to see the shadow move as the earth turned. But I've got two sundials. And if you were to use these two sundials and have children gathered around, one of those dials will reach, read 12 o'clock, 12 noon, oh, okay. and the other dial might read 3 in the afternoon. And you'd have to wait for a while until that dial, or one dial read 3 in the afternoon, and the other one <coughs> read further in, um, well, further in the afternoon, mm -hmm. maybe 6 o'clock. What you have here is two sundials which tell different times. For sharp, faster learners, I would certainly demonstrate this to them because of this is a key to understanding time zones. When I left Edinburgh to Barcelona, I had to change my clock, my watch, yeah. an hour forward. Why do you do that? In this model, you're sowing more seeds to show children time zones. Well, that brings me to the end of this presentation. And um, I'd like to thank you for listening, first of all. I hope it's been valuable. Um, I've taken two questions. Why do we teach science? And how should we teach science? And these are the issues that, um, that, that I've covered. Uh, the most important for me is the storytelling dimension. And for storytelling, you may think of it as conceptual development. It's certainly understanding. It's deep learning. We're looking for children who can tell the stories of science, be they stories about balance of ecosystems, food chains and, and animals, the stories of reproduction, the great stories of the universe we live in, or the stories of... Um, the stories of particles and how the photograph that I showed you early on with me as a child actually it wasn't me because <laughs> the me you see now 
has hardly any other particles in it <laughs> that was in that photograph. And that's another very difficult question to, to tackle, but it's true. That wasn't actually the same person you see now. Um, and then the second question about how should we teach? What do we know about teaching? And if I were to look at the most seriously single item, uh, it, and it's about language. It's about children talking, teachers listening. It's about telling stories. It's about listening to yourself changing your ideas, listening to new ideas emerge, and, uh, and using language is the key to unlocking your understanding, social learning, learning together. Well, I hope those two, uh, those two messages um, are, give you food for thought. I'm going to give you a homework question, <laughs> which is going back to the slide. Do you remember the slide of the book, the book of particle stories? Yes. Well, that's my metaphor of particle stories in a book. The question I offer to you is this, and you can think about this in the restaurants tonight or at home when you're eating your soup or just relaxing. Is that book a book of fact or a book of fiction? Mm. Mm. Food for thought. Thank you very much for listening to me, folks. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. That was fascinating. Pleasure. As I said at the beginning, you will now have a couple of minutes in order to send in any questions or comments that you have about the ideas and activities that um, Bob put forward today in this talk, which I'm sure you have. Um, I certainly... Fine. I'm very happy to hear what you have to say. Don't expect any immediate answers from me. Uh, because I can't solve all problems, but um, I'd be delighted to hear um, if, if any of what I've said resonates with you or has given you food for thought. Um, that's fine for me. Yes, it certainly does with me. Um, that whole idea of a social construction of yeah. knowledge yeah. Is, is it's so obvious and yet we... we it's, the I don't stories, know. it's the stories that scientists have given us. And one yeah. of the things we have to do is to teach children how to tell those same stories. Exactly. Because that's what we're looking for. Exactly. And that's what examinations do. They actually say, can you tell the story behind yes. um, hereditary, behind um, dissolving? Can you exactly. tell the story behind these things? Exactly. And, and not just... Um, having children communicate the story but for you to use those techniques in your teaching yeah, yeah you know creating yeah. a reason why to study what we were saying earlier uh, when I was studying chemistry or biology or when I was studying science in primary school I never knew why I was doing no, it no no I had no, no purpose no and to learn to learn to tell those stories through things like the children love things like role play, things yes. like drama. You can tell the stories of particles through role play, exactly. through drama. The image I showed you of the sheep and the farmer, that could exactly. be done as a drama as well. And with young children. Young, children. young children telling you how they feel when they're leaving, exactly. being taken away. And isn't it sad that we do this or whatever? Those are issues that you can easily build into drama, even being particles in a block of ice. Are there particles in a block of water as it melts? Are there particles of gas? Drama, modelling, modelling in particular, um, they're all part of the mix in, in helping children to tell those stories. Exactly. And in primary, in primary education, storytelling is very much present uh, in yeah, the it curriculum. Is, it is. So why don't we take advantage of it in this we um, should, subject? We should, and what's more, we should, we should take advantage of singing as well. Ah, singing. Because science songs are ah, fabulous, okay. and, uh, and uh, that's another lecture maybe on another day of science songs, but I've written lots of science songs and singing oh, science songs. Yeah, oh, singing great. science songs is a fabulous way to cement ideas. Exactly. And exactly. to build on language. And to build on language and the ability to express oneself, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I've seen raps. I've seen, um, for example, the skeleton. Yeah. I've seen yeah. this. I don't know if you know the skeleton rap. I, I don't. <laughs> it's, no, 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 no. It's but, brilliant. It's, but, it, but of course, you probably will know the old yes. song that talk about your knee bones connected to your thigh bones. Exactly. It's exactly the same it's, idea. It's exactly the same idea. Okay, um, there is one question. Um, people are asking about, um, you know, the, the application of this, um, looking for those opportunities. For example, when, when you were talking about the misconceptions yes. of children, yeah. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how, how, do you, how do you spot those okay. moments? What, what do you, you know, right, is okay. there some kind <clears throat> of... Well, one of the things you have to do in your professional development as a teacher is to wise up to the popular common misconceptions. And they are there. There, there aren't that many, but, the, but you know. I mean, children will tell you that the sun rises and moves around the earth. 
right? Yes. So, so that is well documented. Children will tell you that heavy things will sink and light things will float. Now, you should, if you're teaching floating and sinking, you should forearm yourself with the knowledge of that misconception. Mm -hmm. So I may well start a floating and sinking session once I've, we've explored a few things and actually say, what do you think about what Jason says here? And you invent, or a puppet, or so the puppet might say, I think heavy things uh, sink yes. and light things float. Yes. Okay. So what you're doing is building in, you're introducing that misconception. Saying, so what do you think? How can we discover? What can we do? How can we test? Yes. Let's find things out. Yes, yes, and yes. if you've got a metal paper clip or a metal screw, which is a very lightweight thing, and you ask children to test it, exactly. and if you've got a very large log that you're going to put in the fire this evening, and you ask children to, to, to test that, you'll find that heavy things sometimes float and light things sometimes sink. So when you come back to your puppet, we can actually tell a different story. Fantastic. Okay. But you need to be forearmed mm. with the common misconceptions. Yes. Electricity, full of misconceptions. The electricity comes from the battery. Well, yes. I'm afraid it doesn't. <laughs> okay, it doesn't. That's another story to, to be told. <laughs> or electric current fades away as it goes through light bulbs. No, it doesn't. It stays the same all the way around the circuit. Really? Yes. Um, particles, when things, um, when things melt, the particles go runny. No, the particles don't go runny. <laughs> They're the same particles. They just exist in a different way, they start to move more. Um, there are lots and lots of misconceptions. Um, you know, how we see things, we, we see a candle because vision goes to the yes. candle. And children will draw that arrow going this way. Yes. Right. If you're forewarned and forearmed, you know that's a common misconception, you'll be prepared for it. Exactly. And you can actually show, does it go this way or does it go this way? How can we test? That's, that's really good. That's okay. really, really so good. So being forewarned, and you can find yes. these misconceptions on the internet, or in exactly. books. Um, yeah, I would say arm yourself with the common misconceptions that you know children are likely to have. Exactly. And falling objects is a classic. Heavy things fall faster than light things. Children will tell you that. Adults will tell you that. You've <laughs> only got to test it out. And, and when you test it out, they'll go, do that again. Go on, no, do that again. <laughs> and I've done that are with children. Sure? <laughs> yeah, do that again. Well, I didn't know that. I used to think this, but now I think this. It's that okay. light bulb moment. It's the light bulb it? moment. Yeah. Yes. But you need to focus first on what they already know or think yeah, they know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Not everyone's going to be a, have a misconception no. at all. No. But in fact, all. part of the story, I think, is the part of the skill is to say to children, do you know what? We all, we all come to our lessons thinking different things. Yes. Well, isn't it great? It's part of the great variety yes. of life. But if we're going to become scientists, yes. we will end up telling the same story. So let's learn to tell the same story, the scientist story. Exactly. Together as a yeah, community. as a community. Fantastic. Socially constructed. Thank you very much, Bob. It's a pleasure. You've given us so much food for thought. I think, you know, I think teachers will go away really thinking about, you know, the social construct, the um, space for learning, not the just of for the, the role of language, the communication. I think that's so important because that's when you really demonstrate yep. that you have understood something. The, if you can tell it in your own words. The responsibility not, for yes. citizenship and values. Absolutely. Yes. And the responsibility to sow the seed Exactly. And water the plant, and you don't have to see it grow fully. Exactly. But you do have to sow the seed. Exactly. You have to start the process. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It's a Bob. pleasure. Thank, Thank you for you. listening, everyone. We hope that you have found these teacher training videos of real use and relevance to your classes. We would like to remind you that you can find many more practical teaching ideas and tips articles and video clips in Macmillan Advantage. Don't miss this opportunity to continue your professional development.